Hey everyone, got some exciting news and an exciting video today. This is going to be a deep dive into my World Champ semi-final experience. So the first 15-20 minutes I'm going to talk about exactly how race one and race two panned out and then for those that are really keen uh, I've got more of a deep dive into all of the things that happened on the day, how everyone went, my thoughts, highlights, what's next, all that kind of thing. So stay tuned uh, to the end of the video if you want to see more. i uh, just quickly like to thank Zach Nair uh, and congratulate him on his spot in the semi-final. Some of the footage I've used in this video is from his stream. So the rider on screen in those is him and not me. Uh, so I hope you enjoy. Thanks. So the format of the semi-finals was a two-race uh, points race format where riders would receive points at various banners through uh, the race. Now, the more I considered this, the more I realized how equal this race was for all rider types to have an opportunity to make the semi-final. And even though there was some hard climbing and my wish is a difficult game, there were opportunities for the pure sprinters to qualify. And there were opportunities that if those sprinters qualify, they then are probably going to have a better time at the final as well, um, as there is an extra race, which I might talk about more um, in later um, videos. First race had a nine kilometer. There was a banner on the flat um, after a couple of kilometers. That was the sprinter's chance. The race then trended straight uphill um, for about four minutes before dropping down with a rolly last few Ks with double points at the finish. Double points at the finish meant that basically um, the riders that were going to get to the top of the climb would be able to double dip in this race. The next race, uh, I'll put it up on the screen, a really difficult four kilometer circuit with a 45 second ish, um, 10% steep climb for points at the end of every lap double points on the finish as well so this was the opportunity where all riders kind of mixed on lap one for example you'd have those pure sprinters um, going all in for their next opportunity then you'd have the punches um, and the guys that went well on the climb and then you'd probably have guys that not quite as punchy just trying to hang in there and hope to to get in the shake up as the the race progressed so Really cool course designs the more that I um, race these ones. I was concerned that, you know, a few sprinters would double up and go bang, bang, get enough points to go through and take up maybe two, three places. And then I knew uh, a list of at least 10 riders who I thought were pretty certain to go through. Doesn't leave many spots left and you need to choose where to get the most points or how to maximize those um which i'll talk about in this section i'd done a lot of study on the practice races um that have happened on this course including ones of my own i noticed the practice race where i went harder in the sprint to get points i suffered more on the climb and suffering on the climb is going to mean you can't put in the um the required power to be near the top 20 and then to be uh, doubling up at the finish line. So I made a conscious effort that wouldn't contest sprint points and I'd just continue to roll straight through into the climb going all in for them. I also noticed that riders who had a half-assed attempt at the sprint would also not be able to do the climb unless they were very, very top level, um, like top two, three in the world over the climb could possibly almost double dip but then you've got to come up with the guys um with the mindset of gatesy that the finish line's after 2k and to beat someone like that and then continue on for four minutes requires a lot of strength so i'd even analyze the power for the two sections so the sprint and the climb of riders in the test events and worked out that there was kind of providing you had draft which required going harder than you wanted, the fastest way was going to be pretty much climb power before the climb, not over. So 
for me, I was going for 465, 470 watts. I didn't want to do 30 seconds over 500 uh, in that part because I knew I'd suffer for it in that four minutes. I seen, I had seen riders in other races though do that, but not probably had the draft to get up to where they needed to be. But I hoped what would happen is that the sprinters would just stop and there'd be a wall of them that would be coming through with draft, um, as well as hopefully a few guys with the exact same plan. And that's what happened. So I didn't lose draft the whole time pretty much. So it was it was pretty much perfect. I could see some names of guys who had had a plan to probably um, do both. But in the end, they probably half-assed both. I saw them suffering on the climb. Um, and then by the time I got near the front, there were already some guys like up the road and, and that's fine. Like they just had more power. But the plan that I executed to get to the top of that climb the fastest was absolutely spot on for the semi. It'll be different in the final because everyone gets points at the sprint banner. So you're going to have to work out how many points you want at different paths. It's going to be a lot different tactically um, than this one. But I was I was 95th place, you know, 500 metres out or something, thinking, ooh, and my legs were like, ooh. Um, at that stage, I was like, should I even go? Like, is it too risky to go for these climb points or should I just save myself for the next race and just go all in and hope? I'm glad I stuck with it um, and and gave it a go because it was awesome. Like, I was so dialed in. I was just focusing on my technique, my pedal stroke, that when I um, am out of the saddle, just like straight, pull, push, um, the technique is just so smooth. And when I can do that, I I'm, feel so efficient, like just so efficient. And I wasn't worried about what was happening around me. I was watching the power. I was kind of watching what the avatars were doing and where we were progressing. It was all positive. Um, with a couple of minutes to go, kind of found myself up in the pointy end of, of the chase group, um, which was perfect. That's where I wanted to be. I even was able to, if anything, save a little bit um probably in that two thirds part of the the climb up to the sprint because um I knew that I was where I needed to be ready and with okay legs uh to push that final two hundred meters, which was like sixteen percent and where it was all gonna all gonna happen so that allowed me to get good points um but also because I had a good kick left, we could stretch away from a few of the guys that didn't have the kick left. And then I was safe in a pack of, uh, I think there was like Bjorn, Vidar, myself, Martin, might have been a couple others. Um, and we were able to use the draft well while a few dropped off the back and had to chase to get on, um, which I think really helped. Uh, there was no major concerns in the next 3K. I was pretty prepared pre-race um, that the climbs in the last few K would be all in for me. Um, after that max effort, um, but it probably wasn't quite the case, uh, which was good because in my head, I'd treated this race like a six minute race. Um, I hadn't considered the finish so much. I just knew that or hoped that if I was there, it would take care of itself. And it did. And my classics practice just paid off in spades. Um, I've done a heap of the classics. So you finally get a chance to sprint on my whoosh and get used to. Um, what happens in sprints and I got an opportunity to, to use this and I probably came up against guys who I'd say um, six guys who, you know, they'll probably beat me in the 300 meters in Abu Dhabi. But um, I knew that going early does not have many negatives unless everyone instantly gets in your wheel, which requires basically prediction. Going early is a good thing if you've got the legs um and so as it started to rise up i kicked maintained high speed a few guys reacted pretty well but only the guys that um only the guys that basically predicted it um were able to get near my wheel and um and i think only vita uh caught me towards the end so like that was perfect like for me um not 
mm, I don't have the best sprint in the world. I was really happy with the numbers I pushed for that final 25 seconds. But in that bunch, to be second from the bunch was just perfect. Um, couldn't ask for more. I really put it down to the practice I've done. I've probably done mm, 20, 20 to 30 like hotly contested sprints in the past month with the new dynamics. So I don't reckon many other riders have done that. Um, you know, the SRC riders wouldn't have, the classics haven't been super well attended, um, particularly not by my rider type. So I put all that down to my practice um, and I felt like I knew what to do and it worked. So I was sitting there after that race and, you know, my, my maths had told me that 45 points was enough to go to Abu Dhabi. So it was a weird feeling because then you start to think, oh, nah, but nah, it's close. They, they, people can catch up. So part of me was like thinking I'm through. Part of me was worried I'm not. And then that impacted my mindset in terms of the desire, the fire to like, you know, give it everything for that second race. Um, that's just human nature in a way like i don't see myself as the the best rider in this field by any means my goal has always been to try and sneak into that top 20 so you know i, I am a racer but um it's hard to it's hard to kind of overcome those thoughts and just pretend that it's we're starting at scratch again for race two and that i that i'm desperate to to get the points um i think for me motivation and desperation is a big part of it i think it's a big part of why i've struggled in src i just don't care that much um so when my mind is on like physically i know I, i've got some of the best uh you know five minute power for example but i can't really produce that in an src environment where i'm just not motivated enough to do it um I'm not as externally motivated for the financial reward and that kind of thing I'm um, having a look at the numbers. Uh, so I did we'll pull up some of the Strava data here. 470 watts for five minutes. Um, that is 7.4 watts per kilogram. So beating my old PB of 462. Uh, I think I did from the start line to the top of the hill was about six and a half minutes at about 450. So massive PB there. Um, then we eased off a fair bit. I still averaged about 5.9 for the for the entire 12, 13 minutes of the race. The normalized, I think, about 417 watts at um, 63 kilo race weight. Probably 65 kilos on the bike by the time the race started. So super pumped with those numbers. It was my dream to, to hit 465 or more on the big stage, and I did it. So I knew that's what I've been capable of from the – from the season I've had so far. So to pull it off when it counted is all I can ask for. Race two was delayed by five minutes to what I thought, neither here nor there for me. Um, didn't mind having extra rest, but it's kind of hard. You don't really know how to keep yourself warm and amped up for a PB minute effort um, after such a hard race. Try to do a few little like bursts to, to get the legs going, but mostly recover. Uh, race was pretty stock standard lap one. There was a hard section uh, toward uh, going down the hill, and I have seen a video of the Danish team sending it, which I think is why that happened. Um, I got caught at the back, and I, I put in a bit of effort to try and get closer to the front before the, the sprint. That probably took a bit out of my legs. I had a bad gear change uh, up the hill, and it was, for me, quite costly. The other three hills, I didn't change gear at all, I don't think. And I hadn't planned to. I'd practice the recons in the same gear. Um, it was very much for me a controlled effort rather than seeing what else was happening. I was in my zone and doing my technical um, race. But yeah, fuck the gear change. And it cost me like being anywhere near the 20. Um, luckily, I was able to get back on and get into the race. But yeah, we, we trickled them over. None of the numbers were outstanding in this race. Um, I was kind of surprised that it ended up as like four efforts. I thought from the test events that it would break up more 
into little groups um, with some guys trying to kind of push off the front, some of the stronger guys. But um, no, it was four efforts. All my four efforts were pretty consistent. My second one, power-wise, was my best. Um, but all of them were, you know, pretty solid. They weren't quite as strong as my four by reps earlier in the week, but that's to be expected because my four reps earlier in the week had, you know, a lap in zone one recovery. Um, whereas these certainly wasn't zone one recovery that the rest of the, the lap, um, and also after that first race as well. So can't complain to be able to repeat like that when we did the test events earlier in the year, could not repeat like that at all. Um, but that's where I was in that phase of training and I knew that that's where I needed to work on and that was what the plan was. I came into July kind of in six watt per kilo plus 20 minute shape, threshold tempo work, the base had been built but I needed to add on the, the anaerobic stuff and by the time race day came around, I felt in tip top condition at, at 470 watts, like five minute effort, the, the, the power that was going to be crucial for that first race and I also felt superb. Um, over 600 watts for for periods of time up to about a minute so um the repeatability there it's improved a lot and i'm pretty happy with with where things are at and the ability to to repeat efforts i think looking at where all the other big names were in that race as well like i'm certainly like in the mix and, and on par with those guys even though i was 17th on this stage didn't accumulate the most points you know i was thereabouts um the whole time and I was always around names that are um, you're pretty proud to be around, so um, cannot complain with that. So we've got the final results of the semi-finals here. Things have changed a little bit due to an annulment or two. I've moved up to ninth place, which is fantastic, and booked the trip to Abu Dhabi uh, behind some of the the really top riders there. You can see the breakdown of points from stage one and two. I'll quickly just scroll through that so you can have a look if you're following anyone in particular. Fantastic riders in the top 20 and outside. There's Gatesy, 36th place, really solid Oz debut from him. Wilson, Cam. Downey, Luke, and looks like no secondary for Elliot, unfortunately. So they're the Aussie results, um, and the official results can be seen on the UCI and the MyWish website for anyone wanting to have a look. So race morning was an interesting one. I decided to try and sleep in a separate room to Kate because her alarm was going to go off at 12.40 uh, and I knew that her getting up would probably wake me up and I wouldn't be able to go back to sleep. So I tried that. didn't really work. Her alarm woke me in the end from the other room and that was that. But, um, you know, I was pretty, pretty awake and ready to go. Probably got two hours sleep in total, which is arguably better than I did before Worlds last year. Um, one thing that was good though is when I did get up, there was like an awake vibe to the house because Kate was, you know, about to start a warm up, and um, that was really cool compared to some of the top level races I've done before, where you wake up and it's the middle of the night, no vibes. I had a bit of that adrenaline already, which was which was good, um, and that carried throughout the morning until um, I jumped on the bike the first time. Obviously, Kate was racing in between that, which um, which was so cool to, to watch trying to focus on what I needed to do, but also to support her in, in a massive event. Um, so did the weigh-in uh, two hours out from the event, weighed in at 63.7 kilograms, which is good. Um, wanted to be, you know, just under 64 so that the, the in-game weight would go into 63. So achieved that. Um, and then loaded up on lots of lots of hydration lots of food smashed as much as i could in that regard um prior to the race to give me give me the energy i needed so kate kate's race started at 3 a.m her first race essentially was a two or three minute race um going for that sprint point so super cool to watch um while i was getting ready and preparing i'll i'll run some of the footage here uh kate's plan uh, was to get out in the sprint 
once people started going, she wanted to be on the front foot and, and right there. And she was there the whole time. Um, I think the two Swedish ladies were basically just ahead of her throughout the whole sprint. Um, unfortunately, Kate was probably within six metres of the wheel a few times, but wasn't receiving draft. And, and once she started receiving draft towards the, the the banner, she started to catch up, but she, she didn't have the time to make the ground up. But to still get that 18 points, like super proud. And you can see... Um, her emotion when she gives it a bit, bit of a smile and um, stuff at the end, knowing that, you know, that's set her up with a bloody awesome start and, you know, 18 points on the board is going to get you a pretty good result. I then tried to continue getting ready. The next bit was difficult. I tried to, like, start getting all my computers and everything ready, tried to jump on the bike almost, but to try to see Kate's first lap up the hill. So... Pretty much as soon, like I was ready to start warming up the second Kate hit the hill for the first time, which was, you know, likely going to be the key moment for her. Uh, jumped on about 45 minutes out. I wanted to do a good warm up. I wanted, because straight out of the gates, it was going to be like a, I knew it was going to be a six or seven minute time trial. So you want to be more warmed up than for a normal race. So warmed up felt really good pretty much the whole warm up. Uh, did a lot more at like 450 watts than, than usual. Um, just to get the heart rate up and the legs kind of ready at that that power. That was part of the plan. Um, I think it worked well. My race plan for race one, it, it felt risky to me. I, I'd studied the field pretty well. I'd, and um, I figured my best chance was to, to go for points on the climb and hopefully sneak a few at the finish line as well. But it was really risky and I knew that I had to be in like my top, top form to get points that actually made it viable. You know, if I finish 17th, 18th, 19th place on the climb, you're only picking up a couple of points and that's a really big effort that can kind of cost you points in the next race. And then because I can sprint decently as well at the end of like a two-minute effort, I thought that, you know, it was really hard because – Arguably, I had a chance to get points in the sprint if I went all in, and then I could just save myself for the next race. So I really just had to gamble on the fact that I'd hopefully be like top 14 um, in the field, and I knew that was going to require well in excess of seven watts a kilo for, for five minutes to, to do it. Um, I've seen what these guys have been putting out lately in SRC, um, but lately, you know, I've done a few 450 watt five minute efforts, which is uh, at race day weight, I think 7.1 watts per kilo. And in a few of those efforts, it's kind of felt, you can't say it's controlled, but you feel like there's more to give. So uh, as I said before, I had these sticky notes and I'd written 465 watts on it. I felt like I could finally surpass my 462 watt five minute PB today um, if I just really focused on basically doing a time trial and really not much about what else was happening around me. So that was the goal. Luckily, it paid off. I crossed the line in that climb in eighth, um, which had set me up well. And then I managed to get on those guys in a nice, really nice group heading down where I was able to actually like recover and save a bit of energy and I knew that group was then gonna um, kind of come through for uh, once we caught Lionel we were going to be like fourth to 11th fourth to 12th and you know any points in that range at the double points finish is um, is really handy the plan was to then basically like you know you had to assess from there to see how many points you needed but part of me didn't expect to get the full way through the race with the top guys so I was kind of wanting to go treat the first finish line of the next race like it was all in, um, which I pretty much did. I had a sloppy gear shift, which cost me definitely. But with about 100 metres to go in that climb, I was about 50th. I knew I wasn't getting points. So I was like, ah, oh, dear. Um, luckily, the points I'd got from the first race, I'd ran the numbers and I was pretty certain that that was enough points that I'd be in the top 20, even if I didn't get points. So from that perspective, I didn't feel much pressure anymore. But you, then you still have the doubt. You're like, oh, but what if, what if, like, somehow it's really tight, but there's only 22 people scoring points, so that the points for 20th are going to be higher. Because um, 
I thought 30 might be the line, to be honest, from the maths that I'd done. Um, that turned out to be wrong because it was closer and deeper than my maths predicted. My maths predicted that 10 guys would clean up points after points after points, and then the rest of the points available would go to guys like me um, in that next tier. But it, it was actually spread around a lot more, which made the base of those points higher and the, the requirement to get in more than I'd planned. So 45 from that first race was still enough, but um, only just. Anyway, um, lap two in the earpiece, um, we are kind of talking about um, if I could help Wilson possibly get some points, that would be good. But then Wilson said he wasn't you know, feeling brilliant, so just to focus on myself. And then lap two came through really good um, as I trained. Second half of the climb, still had good numbers left, pushed through the pack um, from probably like 30th and then got up to 10th on the line, 11th on the line for 10 points. When I got that 10 points, I was just like, yes, like that's, that's definitely, that's definitely enough. Um, from, so from there, like it was a hard mindset because uh, look, there was less pressure. So my mind kind of switched out of it a bit. And I had some demons saying, well, it doesn't matter now. Um, so I wasn't really actively chasing the gap to the front. I was letting other people do it. Um, and in my head, I was like, oh, it doesn't matter if the third one goes bad. But then I'd switch on and I'd feel all right again. So I think it was there, but it was just the mindset that you have when like, you know, I didn't expect to be going so well. So to have it kind of in the bag was mentally like I wasn't quite prepared for it so you know my mindset wasn't elite in that second race um had I had the same kind of you know all in focus that I did for the first one maybe I could have picked up some more points um I crossed the line 18th the next time bit of a gap to the front again but um I think uh I think Nair or Kaminsky closed it but again my mindset at that point was like well I'm through. Um, if any of you guys around me aren't through but need to, you're going to be desperate, so you'll you'll tow me back, which happened. Um, I can't have that mindset in the final. Then in the the finish, um, again, like it was cool to watch guys that were desperate pull off breakaways, and it just really played to the mindset of everyone else in the pack that knew they had qualified. Like, well, I don't need to chase this down. So this is where I'm going to highlight quickly one of the stories of the day that I thought, James Barnes. Um, with his permission, I'll, I'll get some of his footage up, but he came from the clouds. Um, just before I go into it, I finished 15th or 16th at the end. Um, so picked up another 10 or 12 points there to, to finish 11th overall with 70 points. But James Barnes... This is where he was halfway through the race. Zero points. So far, not so far, but so far comparatively behind the leaders. Having to work his absolute ass off after that second lap just to get back to the pack by the, the little kick up through that town in a desperate position. Like, he's not going to the, the final at this point. He's nowhere near it. Then, desperation, he makes a, an attack. And then, because he's got guys like me sitting in the pack that have enough points that they're, they're safe, or the people that maybe aren't safe, it's too risky to chase because then they're probably not going to have the legs if it doesn't work to pick up the points. So he gets away. Uh, we give him the gap. Johan Noren, super strong comes across and they help each other out. They go, I think they go one, two on the climb, set himself up, get caught basically on the line again, but are in the pack. Um, and then he does it again. Straight after the um, straight after the the town, um, Pucker and Ollie Jones had went up the road at that point. I guess um, a few people decided they were still racing for the win on the day. Um, but then Barnes went again, got a gap again, one or two desperate riders um, going across as well. Everyone else in the pack just, you know, happy to be through or cooked or waiting for the sprint, not taking risks. 
And then oh, watching that stream, so cool. Um, holding on, holding on, holding on. You can see the gap close, 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 close. And um, in the end, I think he crosses the line sixth, um, easily does enough um, by about 12 points. But, you know, 12 points, that's six spots. That's literally like point something of a second the way they were closing down. So that's um, that's my story of the day in terms of how someone from this position, 8K to go, got to the top 20. Just so hats off, James. Um, super effort, mate. So I'm going to quickly highlight how the rest of the Aussie team went. Uh, so fantastic being part of the the squad again. Uh, we had some a lot of new riders in the the team this year, uh, and then uh, I think the women had a few more experienced riders in there. But um, on the men's side, uh, we had Gatesy, so big Mark Gates out of out of Tassie, who I kind of got into esports with. His plan was to go for the first sprint points, save his energy, and then try and do the same in the second race. Came in in hot, hot form with um, a 30-second PB throughout the week. Uh, the, the Danish riders really made that first sprint hard, and it was a real kind of two-and-a-half-minute max test. Gatesy was super close. I think he got eight points out of that, um, which wasn't a bad start. And then, unfortunately, in the second race, uh, he had a dropout and by the time he came back, he, he was too far off the pack to even get to contest that second sprint. So uh, to come away with 36th place in the world, um, pretty awesome from from Gatesy, especially given he didn't get a chance to to have that second race um, opportunity to, to get those extra points. Uh, the rest of the male team, there are a few issues as well. So um, I know Josh Wilson, he was um, up there in the second race with me um through two laps trying to get a few points in there um didn't have the best lead up in terms of the training uh that he wanted to get done and then i think he um had a bit of a crash um throughout the race not a game crash but a actual virtual bike crash um which i think derailed um how he was performing unfortunately for wilson elliot schultz i think he was probably just outside the points at the finish line in the first race um really good ride for someone who's pretty new to esports and then uh he in the second race i believe another issue stuck at 50 watts his avatar was for some reason apparently so um shame to see that um his result on the leaderboard looks worse um worse than the performance he put in um andrew downey and cam winfield both put in pretty solid rides for their first um, Oz Esports team, um, consistent throughout from the fellas. So well done to them. And then Luke Oldport won his way through the public qual system just outside the points at the um, first banner for Luke. So um, awesome experience for him. So you should be proud of his efforts. In the women's side, again, um, just I feel super bad for Vicky Whitelaw. She wasn't able to enter the race, which I know a few people weren't, which is really disappointing at the at the world level. Uh, so shame for Vicky. Um, so obviously Kate just outside the top twenty, super proud, like first Nash, uh, first worlds. Um, only been cycling for you know not even two years, and and she's putting in that kind of effort. She's only going to keep going from strength to strength. Executed her plan perfectly. Um, unlucky not to win the first sprint and then, um, you know, mix it up with her second best ever one minute on the on the climb in the second race. She was there with him on the second lap to have a second chance. But when you when you got to try and take on uh, riders like Lou Bates and Fiora with the, that repeatability, it was always going to be difficult to get more points for her. So super proud. She was the first Australian, um, which is fantastic. Tilly Field had a good ride. Um, she picked up, I think, 15 points as well. Um, and then the other ladies uh, all put in a, a pretty strong effort. So, so awesome to be part of the Oz team. Uh, and, you know, it looks like I'm the only one that will get the opportunity to race um, in Abu Dhabi, which is a privilege. Um, really kind of cements myself as as one of the top esports races and, and hopefully um, 
gives me a chance for for more opportunities that might be on the on the horizon in 2025. I guess there are wild card spots um, available in Abu Dhabi as well, so you never know. Might get a, a professional Australian to to join me um, on the team, but uh, you never know. Looking at the makeup from the provisional results. There are a lot of teams with not many numbers, so we're all in a similar boat. I think there are seven nations with one, four nations with two qualified, and Belgium have five. So big advantage. They dominated. They probably were expected to dominate as well. They've got a super list of riders. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens um, at the next stage given the, the weighting of the numbers. And I know Sweden are probably the same in, in the women's with a lot qualified and some really good team tactics. So... That'll make a diff- difference with, with only 20 riders and um, having limited resources to kind of um, chase moves and things like that, and especially when everyone will get points at every section. Just quickly want to point out um, something that I find I think holds the sport back a little bit um, in terms of the promotion and celebration and it's the, the verification process um, after a result. So, you know, I sit here right now and I'm hesitant to start making this video because I'm waiting for that official tick. Um, you know, you, you don't want to make a celebration video and then receive the news that you've been annulled. Um, you don't want to post on social media saying that you're going to um, Abu Dhabi for the final and then get your result annulled. So, and I think... You know, you, you never know um, what the, the data is going to look like. Um, obviously, in my wish, you connect in-game. And we were recommended to not, um, you know, use head units to do any extra dual recordings um, and that kind of thing. So I can connect my Bluetooth for Vero's in-game. I can then connect Ant Plus to a uh, head unit. But I just didn't want to risk it given um, I know that um, there are some issues with whoosh and more connections equals more chance of failure. So I don't know what my Favero's read. So it's, you know, you sit here and you you hope that, that you get that tick and I'm sure everyone's in the same boat, which is why I haven't really seen too many official posts about going yet. So given that the time delay in that, it kind of makes it hard to celebrate the um, the sport and the athletes. And then I know like social media, if if it was a, a running race or a um, in real life race you know that's what happened and and the social media outlets can promote that asap like the uci haven't posted anything my whoosh have said that our finalists are being verified or cycling therefore won't post anything because it's not official and there's currently no official results to post so that kind of delay um it, it's essential at the moment but it it certainly holds the sport back a little bit in terms of the promotion. So, you know, if, if um, for example, I was to get an old, I'm probably not going to put this in, in the video, am I? So um, that's a factor. And, you know, I'd love to be telling people that I'm going to Abu Dhabi, but, you know, you just, you just want to wait until you get that email. And I've been checking my phone and I'm really excited to, to see the news because, you know, that's, it's a big goal. The experience will be so cool. Um, meeting meeting all these people that you you kind of look up to and race against regularly, and you might have had conversations with via message and and all that kind of thing. And you know, then there's going to be the, the elite females there. There's going to be all of the key um, esports people, uh, people that have sent me messages congratulating me and saying they're looking forward to meeting me. Um, and likewise, um, it, it'll be a fantastic experience and I'm sure I'll have many questions as to how it's going to work, what the, what the trip will look like, um, things about the setup, um, getting there, getting things there, uh, to make things as normal as possible, the, the setup in the arena, the temperatures, the stability of the front, like just there will be countless things that between now and then we'll have to figure out, but the experience in itself will be awesome. And hopefully, fingers crossed, uh, could be the first of um, hopefully multiple Middle Eastern trips in, in the future. 
just like to give a quick shout out to anyone who's picked up um, these videos, subscribe to the channel. I know I don't do a massive amount, but I've been enjoying just doing dribs and drabs over the last few months um, along the way and being in good form. It's been nice to be able to share um, some of that with people. Obviously, um, Mackay Cycles have really stepped stepped on board the past few months, believed in me, and um, here I guess I've shown them what I'm capable of. So um, super thankful to Kyle and the, the team there. Um, obviously, partnering with Wahoo and Specialized through that, which is awesome. And then, um, you know, a lot of people in my corner, like Kate especially, um, you know, living the dream with Kate and being on that same journey together makes it really, really simple and, and smooth sailing. Uh, not many people really understand what I'm doing now. Uh, I don't really publicly kind of talk about it too much at work or on messages and that kind of thing. It's it's a really different world to when I was running, you know, semi-professionally and, you know, you'd post stuff all the time. You'd, you'd, you'd have a lot of a um, lot in common with your contacts, you'd message about it. Whereas, you know, most of my best friends barely knew that the, the World Champs was on uh, the other morning. So um, it, it's different, but the, the people that are, you know, the true supporters kind of know what's happening and know the significance of where I'm at in my sporting journey and um, some of the opportunities that, that lie ahead now. So um, thanks to everyone who's been on board. Uh, the crew at Aero and Tully for, um, you know, they helped me when I was getting set up at the at the top level and that kind of thing. Good crew of racers at Aero. And um, I know those guys, you know, if the time zones were different for a lot of the elite racing, we'd be, you know, we'd be near the top end of the, the tree. But, um, you know, not everyone has the commitment to esports to want to wanna wake up at 1am for a weigh-in and, and it's understandable. So, um, the crew down there are awesome, even though we're not as um, represented on the world stage as we as we should be. Just on top of that, um, I did a little community post the other day, but they wouldn't get much traction. Um, so Mackay Cycles have got the Zwift One Kicker Core Bundle uh, in stock at the moment. Uh, pretty new to Australia. It helps you get set up on Zwift as smooth as possible. Got all the virtual shifting um, and that kind of thing set up. So... You don't need to worry about changing uh, mechanically on hills and that kind of thing. Would have been awesome for me uh, to have it well champs. Virtual shifting is cool. I've used it on Kate's before. Kicker 5, which I currently run at the moment, doesn't have it. So I've had to perfect uh, the art of the gear change. Luckily, thanks to Kyle and the crew, my Specialized is super smooth shifting compared to my old bike and it's made a massive difference. Um, you know, but if you've got an average setup or looking to, to get into into the game, um, it's a nice affordable setup. The Kicker Core, um, they've put a lot into making that a, a prime mover in the in the game. And you know, although it probably doesn't work on Woosh uh, as as you would like, if you're locked into Zwift, and I know Zwift still have the stranglehold on the esports market share. Jump on free shipping and ten percent off using Zwift Core in caps in the coupon section uh for my followers what's next for me is quite an interesting one and i'll finish the video here um obviously the world's at the end of october is is massive and it's the goal now i mean got a few little mindsets um about what to tackle um the season's just starting at the the top level um, you know, I've been up for, for quite a while now. The end of the season's March. I'm not sure what to do. Um, I've got a few options. You know, the Worlds are soon. Do we do we continue to go all in for, for Worlds um, and then maybe have a quick breather heading into trying to peak in March for, for the Zwift games? Do we go a bit back to basics now? Like, it, it's a hard mindset because I understand I'm not going to win the world champs. Um, that's just being realistic. There are guys with more more punch than me. There are better climbers than me. And almost everyone is a better sprinter, pure watts-wise, than me at the final or heavier. Um, so with the three-race format, it suits me less. 
I was 17th in stage in the second race there overall. Um, yeah, it's it's tricky. There are, I know I'm on par with the climbers um, on my day, but like mid-pack, like, you know, getting, as I said, like fifth at the stage the other day. So I can be in that range, but it's so close that like on, on an off day, you can be like 16th. Like there are all 20 of the guys that qualified have a good five minute. Um, so it's, it's hard to, to know whether to continue to try and like strive for every single ounce um, when it might be the difference between 13th and 14th or 13th and 17th or versus thinking a bit more long term knowing that it would be good to um you know try and be there for a tilt at the, the Zwift games and the Zwift season so I had to sacrifice the first Zwift qualifier puts me in a bad spot as well so I need to do well in the World Series to to catch the points up to qualify for Zwift games so I need to go back and decide what's going to be best for me uh, for the next six months to be able to do everything that I want to do uh, and be in this kind of shape because I'm a new level to what I was last year. And I think it's because of the, like partly because of my more periodized approach to things. At this stage, I'm probably leaning towards, um, you know, going all in for, for Worlds, for the final. That'll mean I'm in good nick for race two and three of the Zwift games. Then maybe we take a little reset, maybe not a massive one compared to end of season, but a little one, and then try and um, get a bit more back to basics, hope to do enough in race four and five of the World Series to um, qualify for Zwift games and hopefully peak there. And I guess then uh, more info about the 2025 Olympics might be available too, like months and that kind of thing, um, selection process, because that's a massive goal of mine um, for next year. So that'll depend when when that is as well. And hopefully being the top Aussie at the Worlds, put my best foot forward for selection there um, on top of like the Zwift Games result where, um, you know, we'll basically equal second um, the Zwift Games. So it's been a good season, hopefully. Um, we can realize a lifelong dream there, but got things to think about. Like, unlike some people, I don't have a coach, um, use my kind of history in sports science and, and my, um, an analytical brain to, to come up with the, the plan, but, um, we'll, we'll see what's, what's next on the radar and I'll, I'll keep you, keep you posted and, and keep sharing videos on the channel. So thanks for watching. I know it was a long one, but I'm sure that um, esports kind of fanatics would hopefully um, take a bit out of out of it. Apologies for not streaming. I just didn't want my wish to crash. I didn't want that added risk or anything like that. So hopefully I've got permission to use um, some of the footage that's out there. Otherwise, it's just going to be me on the little camera screen, screen with the washing in the background, um, talking in a bit of a one-on zero podcast formats. I tried to mix, um, we didn't get given our jerseys in game or anything, they put them on us, but I tried to mix and match what would look good in the Australian kit. So I put the, the yellow hat on, I think I had yellow socks on maybe, white shoes, all stuff that would go well with the white, green and gold kit, and I think it looked all right. So anyway, hope you enjoyed it. See you in the next one. and. Hopefully, we're going to Abu Dhabi when the verification um, is official. This is when this video will be released. Um, so thanks for watching. Cheers.